If you have your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to look a little bit into the nation of Israel here. And we all are familiar with the nation of Israel, right? They, they're God's chosen people and they've walked with him perfectly, right? You know, uh, the Lord has given the, the, us and the nation of Israel. He started out with the, the Ten Commandments, right? What was the first commandment? Okay, well, that's the greatest commandment. The, 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 the first one is, Thou shalt have no other gods beside me, right? Or before me? You know? And, and which, which commandment do you think the nation of Israel struggled the most with? Uh, probably one of those, right? That one right there? You know, as we're going to find out, the Lord sent them because of, of, of their problems. First, he sent them to Egypt. And let's just say there was a, a few uh, gods in Egypt, weren't there? You know, you look at the ten plagues, and it was really God demonstrating his power, that there was no God in Egypt. It was, it was God was with his people. And then his people, you know, they, uh, after, you know, they come into the promised land and God had blessed them, they kind of, they, they slid a little bit, didn't they? And they started into, into idol worship. And so he said, you want to worship idols? I'll send you to Babylon. You know, like, let's just say it's the idol capital of the world. And it's interesting, when you see them come back out of captivity, they no longer have an idol worship problem. Now they get into legality. They, they, you know, they, they, they're, you know, we were kind of talking about that a little bit in Sunday school. You know, they, they, it was all about the, the law and, and how they perceived it and how they'd added to it and stuff. So they're always struggling with something. But let, we're going to start out here in Isaiah chapter 43. We'll start out at verse 14, talking about God's people. And it says here, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitive all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy, your holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. God had sent them into captivity. And God says, even though I have used Babylon to punish you, now I'm going to punish Babylon because we know that they basically went above and beyond. They, you know, they, they were wicked towards the nation of Israel. They did the things that God didn't approve of. And he says, you know, because of their pride and their arrogance that he was going to bring them down, God still remembers his people. Verse 16 this is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. You know, the, uh, a quick synopsis of God rescuing his people out of Egypt. You know, the, the mighty armies. You know, Babylon, that was a mighty army. God rescued his people and brought them back. E Egypt, God rescued his people and brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. You know, uh, the, the story of how the Lord did that, you know, maybe you remember Charlton Heston and, you know, the Ten Commandments and, and, and the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, the crossing at the Red Sea. I think that was a fairly good depiction of it because there's those people that believe, you know, if you read some of the footnotes and some of the Bibles that they crossed at the Reed Sea, which isn't very deep. But, you know, he, he laid waste to the armies of Egypt. And, and I, you know, I've seen pictures of where they think that crossing is. If you go and they die, they've dove down and they find chariot wheels and things like that there, that water is like 150 feet deep right there at the Red Sea at the crossing. The power of God to rescue his people. 
you know, splitting that water and they crossed over on dry land. What is our Lord capable of? You know, he, he, he can do mighty works and he snuffed out the enemies. You know, for the, for the nation of Babylon, they were overthrown. You know, God had given Nebuchadnezzar the dream and for Nebuchadnezzar, he was the head of gold. And he was happy about that. He didn't care about the rest of it. He's not that head of gold. The nation of Egypt, they were so proud of themselves. You know, they weren't going to let his people go. And finally, the Lord, through the ten plagues, you know, his people were let go. With the final plague being the, the death of the firstborn, you know, at the Passover. So many things there for us prophetically that we can learn from. And we can, we can see God's plan, not only for his people, but for all of humanity. But that brings us to verse 18, and it says now, and again, this is the Lord speaking. <clears throat> it says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The Lord says here he's going to do a new thing, but don't dwell on the former things. How many people love, have you heard, love dwelling on the former things? Or let me put it this way. How many people have you ever heard saying, the good old days? <laughs> oh, the good old days. You know, back when we had to walk uphill both ways to school, barefoot in snow three feet deep. You know, stuff like that. You know, even though it's bad outside right now, we've got it good. You know, the amount of food we have available to us, the, the housing we have available, us, the transportation. We're, I mean, we can go anywhere in this world if we decide to. I mean, people can even fly to Antarctica if you, if you got a notion to. But here he's saying, don't dwell on, on the former things, the past things. You know, and God is talking to his people spiritually. Dwelling on the past things, the old things. God had established a covenant with his people, and yet they weren't able to keep that covenant, were they? They struggled because we are sinful human beings. We have a sin nature. It was given to us by Adam, passed down to us. But God here is saying, okay, don't dwell on those old things. You know, the nation of Israel, they were always looking back at the good old days. You know, we have a friend who is a Jew by, by descent. And for them, they're always looking back to, to Moses, to the law. It's funny as we had them over one time and he, he, he offered to pray with us you know, for our food and he, and he prayed in Moses' name. And because they dwell in the past in the old things. God's telling his people, don't do that. He's going to create a new thing. He says, see, I am doing a new thing. You know, later on we're told that he, he, he's proclaiming that there's going to be a new covenant for his people. One that we can actually keep because it's, it's not weakened by the sinful nature of human beings. See, God's law is perfect. But he's saying to us, now, I know you need a Savior because you're not capable of keeping my law. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert. Remember John the Baptist? He, he was the voice of one in the desert proclaiming a way of the, for the Lord. You know, the Lord, you know, the picture of the desert is that dry place. You know, it's not too hard for us to imagine that. All you have to do is go out a couple miles out onto the desert and, and you can see the evidence of a dry place. You know, but spiritually, his people were in that dry place. They, they'd walked away from God. You know, and God had sent them into captivity and he caused the nations to rise up against them, but yet still they dwelt there because their hearts, even though they might be good today, they would drift and, and they would get their eyes off of God. <laughs> does, does that happen today too? Yeah. But see, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, we're told in the new covenant, he'll write his law upon our hearts. 
you know, and, 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 and there's a chance for us then because, you know, about the time we start messing up, I don't know about you, but God's word comes, you know, just clearly back to me and ringing in my ear saying, the Lord said not to do that. But it says here, and making streams in the wasteland. Remember the Lord met with the woman at the well? And, and he said to her, basically, if you would have known who it was that was here with you, you would have asked me for, for water, and I would have given you living water. Talking about the Holy Spirit coming, dwelling inside of her and, and welling up into life. Her mind was still stuck in the, in the physical. When we talk about that vertical, she was thinking vertically. Man, I don't have to come and get water every day. I want that water. And Jesus was talking about the vertical, the spiritual. But God has got something new for his people. And, and, and it says, the wild animals honor me. This is verse 20. The jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The purpose for mankind is found right there. We are to praise God, to thank him. You know, we come together, we call it a worship service. You know, we, we sing his praises, we sing songs, and, and we read his word, but are, are, you know, are we singing his praise, proclaiming the goodness of God? So that, that's what the, the nation of Israel, they were supposed to be about, proclaiming the goodness of God to the, to, to the world around them. But they got focused on themselves. You know, for them, the Gentiles... Uh, you know, they, they were just good for the, the, the fires of hell. We're God's chosen people. They'd lost sight of God's purpose and his plan. And notice it continues on. It says, yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. They uh, Prayer. Prayer and praise. Worship, the covenant, all those things, they, their heart wasn't in it. Prayer. He says, you have not called upon me, O Jacob. Is prayer a part of the Christian's life anymore? You know, I, I, I think back to when I was a little kid. and You know, for a little kid, you know, our prayer lives were, were pretty small because our, sp you know, our uh, span of attention was pretty small, you know. You know, it was usually something like, bless this food and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen, you know. But that problem is, is for a lot of mature Christians, that's their prayer life still. You have not called upon me, O Jacob. What can we bring to the Lord in prayer? Thanksgiving. We can bring thanksgiving and praise, our cares, our, the people we pray for, for salvation. You know, God, asking God to intervene in other people's lives, asking for mercy and blessings upon our lives, and I mean, there's we cannot exhaust the things that we should bring to prayer to God. That list should be inexhaustible, but yet, for a lot of people, it doesn't exist at all. I would challenge you: make a list of things you can praise God for. We've been talking about that in Ephesians, right? Ephesians chapter 1. There, let me just remind you of a couple of these things. Uh, we can praise him for the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. How many spiritual blessings do we have in Christ Jesus? All of them. It's not like you enter the beginner's program and start earning them as you go. We get them all in Christ Jesus. How about him choosing us? Can you, can you praise God for him choosing us? Yeah, I mean, I look at myself and go, Lord, you're, you're picking the, the bottom of the barrel here. I, I remember as a kid, you know, I, I'd play softball. You, you remember that everybody would line up and they'd go through and pick, you know, you, this team gets that person, that person, you know, and you'd go through. I was usually one of the last two people they'd pick because I couldn't play softball. But 
you know, for me, that's how I, I see myself. Well, Lord, you, you chose me, even though I'm terrible at, at being a Christian. But he still chose me because it's in Christ Jesus. You know, and he, and he declares us holy and blameless. Can you praise God for that? Even though you did it, he still says you didn't do it. Because of his son and Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And how about adoption by God? Can you, can you praise God that he adopted you into his family? And that you get to eat at his table for forever? You have not called upon me, O Jacob. You know, when we call upon the Lord, we, we, can, we can praise him. We can thank him. In fact, that's what Psalm 100 says. We're to enter his presence with thanksgiving and, and with praise. But they weren't even doing that. You can kind of get the vision that worship had become just ritual. I'm sure glad that doesn't happen today. Wait. People just go to church because that's what they do. I think that's one of the things we found out during COVID. Is the people that went to church because that's just what they did. We always went to church. Well... Now they just don't go to church because they've developed a different habit. It wasn't in their heart. It wasn't in the nation of Israel's heart either. It says here in verse 23, You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burned, burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. See, in the sacrificial system, these are the things that were prescribed to bring as, as offerings and as sacrifices to God. And it says here, they weren't doing it. Well, now we're under the new covenant. We don't have to bring these sacrifices anymore. You and I get to bring different sacrifices. The sacrifice of praise that, that confesses the Lord and praises his name. How many churches are bringing those sacrifices to God today? How many Christians are spending time praising the Lord, bringing him those offerings? I think we, we've seen a decline in that. You look in the book of Revelation. You know, there the picture was the, before the altar of the Lord and the, and the angels were bringing the, 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 the censers full of the prayers of the saints, which were the incense to God. They were a sweet aroma. How much worship of God is going on in even our lives today? But he says, you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. Verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sakes. Sake. Under the old system, the blood of the covenant, it was found in, in the innocent substitute that was, was the lamb or the goat, whatever the offering was that was prescribed. When the shedding of the blood was, was, was performed, it was the blood, you know, the covenant. You know, we find that in Leviticus chapter 17, verse uh, 10. Let me just read that to you real quick here. Leviticus 17, verse 10, or excuse me, verse 11 says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. God provided a way. But he says here that you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. They weren't even seeking repentance. They weren't even seeking forgiveness. But yet God is the one that provides it. And he blots out your transgressions for his own sake. See, this God does for himself. Why? We're his prized possession, his prized creation. You know, remember during the days of creation, after he created man, he looked down and it's, he said it was very good. Not just good, 
but very good. We were created for fellowship with God, for worship, to praise Him. And he goes on to say, he says, review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case of your innocence. Anybody in here innocent? <laughs> Nation of Israel, this is what he's asking them. He said, are you innocent? You know, and there's probably some very religious people in there with that went, oh, I'm innocent. Oh, really? You know, he says, state your case. Bring it before me. He says, your first father sinned. Adam. You know, like we've said before, how many of you have seen a little child and, and they're just natural born sinners? You don't have to teach them to say no. You don't have to teach them how to get angry. You don't have to teach them any of that stuff, right? They, it, it's in there. So to declare that, that they don't have sins, you know, that they're innocent, that's a false, you know, that's a false argument. We're guilty at birth. Your first father sinned. Your spokesman's rebelled against me. So I will disgrace your dignitaries of your temple and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. This is God talking about his people. But he says, I'm providing a new way. Do you perceive it? They should have perceived it. It's, you know, the Lord has left clues all throughout his word about what he had planned. From Abraham. You know, Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain. And, and he basically, as they were going, you know, the gospel was explained to him. You know, and Abraham explained it to Isaac. He says, you know, here's the fire, here, here's the wood, here's the altar, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham so prophetically told Isaac, God himself will provide the sacrifice. Looking forward to Jesus. The nation of Israel, they were going through the motions. Today we see so many people just going through the motions. We call it a worship service, but are people truly worshiping? Or are we back to that image Nebuchadnezzar set up of the idol, where people, you know, they're, they're, they're going through the motions. You remember, you know, in, in that story that whenever they heard the musical instruments, they were to fall down and worship. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not. Well, just be, by the act of falling down, was that true worship? Is that what God's looking for from his people? No, he's looking for true worship and true praise. Well, that brings us back to, to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn there with me. We've made it all the way down to verse 7. It's only taken us a month. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says here, now, talking again about Jesus. Okay, this, this, this has been the reoccurring theme through these verses. It's in Christ Jesus. Okay? So it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Remember back there in Isaiah, he, he, he says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. How did he accomplish that? But in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's in the blood. You know, and it's the covenant that was contained in the blood of Jesus that provides that for us. We have redemption. You know, that, that, that's something maybe that we don't resonate with so much anymore. You know, in, in the time that the, that the Bible was written, that would have resonated with people. There were like 60 million slaves 
60 or six million, six million slaves in Rome. And they understood what it was to be redeemed out of the slave market. Hey, if you, there was no bankruptcy, there wasn't any of that. Basically, if you couldn't pay your debts, you, you, went, you became a slave. Or you might have been born into it. <clears throat> but here, it's through Jesus, we have redemption. That word is basically, I'm not going to pronounce it in the Greek, but it's a release affected by payment of ransom. We have been redeemed. We've been bought out of the slave market for his purpose. And it's in Christ Jesus. And it's through his blood that that, that was accomplished. Our sin debt was paid in full. And notice it says, the forgiveness of sins. When he forgives us, the Bible says he chooses to remember our sins no more. I, I, I kind of I cringe when people say God forgets. No, he didn't forget your sins. He chose to remember them no more. They're no longer held against you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's something to praise God for. Because I don't know about you, I'm guilty. You know, I, I'm, I, entering into his court, I know the sentence is death. I committed the crime, now I got to do the time. And the judge looks at me, and because I've accepted his son as my savior, he declares me not guilty. That should elicit praise from God's people. Thanksgiving. That you don't get what you deserve. <laughs> That's called mercy. And we get what we don't deserve. It's called grace. But we get our eyes on the world, don't we? Well, God, I want the, the, the mansion. I, I, I want the Rolls Royce. I want the, the, the fancy jobs or all these things that we and no, you know, what we, we 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 need to get our eyes on him and what he has already accomplished for us. See, that was the problem. The nation of Israel, they got their eyes off the Lord and they said, We want to be just like everybody else out there. They wanted a king. Well, the Lord, you know, through Samuel, he says, That's fine. They're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me the church we you know we, we tend to get our eyes off of off the lord and we get them on the world around us saying boy i want i want to go out and have fun on sundays or i want to go out and do this i want to you know do the things that the world does <clears throat> instead of saying you know what lord you've saved me you redeem me out of that way of life the way of death and brought me into the kingdom of your son you know i think back in an and, you know, on the first day, God says he, cre you know, he separated the light from the dark. Well, that's what he's done in our lives. He's separated the light from the dark. Adam, after he sinned, he was separated from God. The darkness was separated from the light. Well, we were that darkness. And we've been brought in to the light once again. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with, his, with the riches of God's grace. How rich is God's grace? I mean, I, I think of that word grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. That's just a simple way for a simple person to remember it like me. God's riches. What does he own? What does he control? How much power does he have? How much authority does he have? And it's all given. It's available. That he lavished. You know, that idea is, you know, when you lavish maybe some attention on somebody, it's almost too much, isn't it? You know, I, I, I can see that kind of being a grandparent now. You kind of lavish your love and attention on your grandkids, right? 
you know, even when they're being a little bit ornery sometimes, it's like, oh, that's okay. Go back to mom. Go back to dad. He lavished on us. But notice it's with all wisdom. See, the thing is, is that God knows us. He knows our nature. It's not like, boy, I'm going to pick this one and I sure hope he won't mess up. You know, in my mind, it's like, Lord, yeah, you, you shouldn't have done that because I'm going to mess up. It's not like he says, ah, they blew it. I thought I picked the right one finally and they just blew it. No, with all wisdom and understanding, he chose us. But it's in Christ Jesus. With all wisdom and understanding. One more passage before we close this evening. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting out of verse 21. And we could spend hours and days on each one of these passages, but I just want you to see the theme that is throughout the Bible. God tries to get the message to us by repeating it over and over again for us. In verse 21 it says, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Remember he said he's doing something new? Do you perceive it? A righteousness apart from the law. See, that's what the nation of Israel understood. You know, if you're going to be righteous, you had to fulfill the law. And, and, and when you do make a mistake, there's all these different offerings and, and sacrifices that can be made for atonement. But now God has provided to us a righteousness apart from the law that has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. I love the word all there. It's to everyone who believes. There is no difference. For all have sinned. Again, that all. It removes any doubt. Maybe you think, well, I'm not so bad. I'm living a pretty good life, so maybe I'm not a sinner. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes me, okay? And are justified. There's that judicial term again. It's just as if I'd never sinned. We are justified freely. God's the one giving it. We can't pay for it. We can't earn it. We don't merit it. He gives it to us freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Again, redemption. A release affected by payment of ransom. Righteousness. Judicial approval. The approval of God. This all came to us through Jesus. Not because we're good little boys and girls. Not because we go to the right denominations. Or, or that we've done righteous things on our own. It's through Jesus. It says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He's the sacrifice of atonement. At one moment with God. That's the only way I can remember that word. At one moment. We were brought back to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's God that presented him the as the sacrifice. In, in, the, in, the, in the old covenant, the, 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 the sinner had to bring the sacrifice, and the sacrifice was examined. In the new covenant, God presented the sacrifice to cover our sins. And it's presented as a gift to us. And all we have to do is believe. Put our faith in Christ. It's not enough to believe about Jesus. That's the problem. Is There's a lot of churches out there preaching Jesus. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's a name. It's, it's, a, it's just another name. 
but do we believe in him, in what he has done for us on the cross? That he is God's only begotten son, the son that he loves, and he's the only blemish, perfect sacrifice that would suffice God's wrath and his anger against mankind to pay for the sins that we had committed. Is that the Jesus that you believe in? Then we have these promises. The promises of Ephesians and the promises of Galatians and of Colossians and of, uh, of Romans and of, and in the book of Revelation. It's because of Jesus that we have these promises. I don't know about you, but we have real good reasons to pro uh, praise God and to worship him. I, I, I think the simplicity of it is we don't get what we deserve. And we get God. We have peace with God because of Jesus. We have that atonement, that atoning sacrifice because of him. Now we can approach God again. That which was lost in the Garden of Eden has been found in Christ Jesus and we have access to God now. Direct access. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We can pray to him. We don't need somebody to pray for us. We get to go to our Father and praise him bring our prayers to him, tell him our cares, our concerns. We can burden him with our cares, lay our, all our burdens on him because he cares for us. And it's all for his purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, let's praise the Lord, okay? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we don't deserve the love that you've poured out upon us. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I, I just lift up my brothers and sisters, all of us, in your church, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes to the gift that we have been given in your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to perceive the, 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 the sacrifice that was made and the covenant that was established between us and you, Lord that if we would just put our faith and our trust in, in what your son did for us, believe in his name, that we have eternal life. Lord, thank you. Lord, help us to be ambassadors that you've called us to be, to live worthy of the calling that we've received and the, and the blessings that have been bestowed upon us. Lord, we love you and we ask now that you'll be with us, that you'll guide us, and that you will just challenge us, Lord, to be the people you've called us to be. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.